I think for a lot of people, a visit to Rome conjures up images of Julius Caesar, probably the most famous personality from ancient Rome. And so you may be wondering, where can you find traces of Julius Caesar in modern Rome? Now, while it's easy to find reminders of the Roman Empire all around the city, it's less obvious to find signs of Julius Caesar than you might think. For example, the Colosseum, Castel Sant'Angelo, and the Pantheon were all built after Caesar's death. And while we have a few famous sites here in Rome that we can definitively link to Julius Caesar, it can be difficult to trace his life in Rome because many of the monuments, buildings, and places associated with him have either disappeared or changed so dramatically in the last 2,000 years that we might need a little bit of imagination to place him there. All right, first of all, who was Julius Caesar and why is he so famous? Here is a very brief history, but stick around because after this short bio, I'm gonna share with you some places in Rome where you can trace a Julius Caesar, and I have a few that I think might surprise you. Hey guys, if you are enjoying this video, would you please go ahead and hit that like button and please consider subscribing. Julius Caesar was a Roman general and statesman. He rose to power through a string of military victories which ended with the Gallic Wars, defeating the area we associate today with France. After this victory in 49 BCE, the Roman Senate demanded that Caesar disband his army and return to Rome as a private citizen. Caesar outright defied the Senate's authority when he crossed the Rubicon River and marched towards Rome at the head of his army. This was the beginning of Caesar's civil war, which he won. This left him in a position of almost unchallenged power and influence in 45 BCE. And now you know where we get the phrase, crossing the Rubicon. It means you've passed the point of no return. After assuming control of the government, Caesar began a program of social and governmental reform, including the creation of the Julian calendar. He bestowed citizenship on residents from far corners of the Roman Republic, and he initiated a series of huge building projects. In 44 BCE, Julius Caesar declared himself to be dictator for life, dictator perpetuo. The Roman Senate was fed up. And so, on the Ides of March 44 BCE, Julius Caesar was assassinated by a group of senators led by Brutus and Cassius. He was stabbed 23 times on the steps of Pompey's theater. Sadly, his assassination had the opposite effect of what the conspirators wanted. Rome was plunged into a new series of civil wars and the constitutional government of the Republic was never fully restored. Caesar's great nephew and adopted heir Octavian, later known as Augustus, rose to power after defeating his opponents in the last civil war of the Roman Republic. Octavian solidified his power and the era of the Roman Empire began. If you want to know more about Augustus, I highly recommend the book Augustus by John Williams. This is a fictional book that fairly accurately depicts the life of Octavian Augustus from the moment he hears of his uncle's murder to his own death in the year 14 CE. It's really well done as a series of imagined epistles between all the important players such as Cicero, Brutus, Mark Antonio, and many more. Today, many historians consider Julius Caesar to be one of the greatest military commanders in history. If you'd like to know more about the life of Julius Caesar, I recommend the book The Twelve Caesars by Suetonius. And one more book I highly recommend if you want to understand how Rome got to be what it is today is Rome, A History in Seven Sackings by Matthew Neal. All right, so how do we trace Julius Caesar's life in Rome? Here are places you can find traces of Julius Caesar in Rome, both visible and invisible. Julius Caesar was born on the 12th or the 13th of July in 100 BCE. Historians are not certain of the exact location of Julius Caesar's birth, but they think that it was in Subura, which was a densely populated neighborhood of ancient Rome. Today we know this area as Monti, and you can see it behind the Forum of Augustus. The Subura was known for its narrow, bustling streets and diverse population. It was also known as the Red Light District. Visitors often pass the Teatro di Marcello, or the Theater of Marcellus, and mistake it for the Colosseum. And while it does resemble the Colosseum, it was actually built almost a hundred years earlier. When Caesar defeated his rival Pompey in Rome's civil war, he wanted to build a theater much larger than Pompey's theater, which Pompey had built in 55 BCE. Construction of this theater began while Caesar was alive, but he didn't live to see it finished. The theater was completed by Caesar's grandnephew and adopted heir, Augustus, in 13 BCE, and it fulfilled Caesar's hope. It did become the largest theater in the Roman Empire. Augustus dedicated the theater to his beloved nephew, Marcellus, who had passed away at a young age due to an illness. 
The theater was an interesting blend of Greek and Roman architectural styles, as was common in that era. Take a look at the columns that adorn the exterior. This is one of the earliest uses of columns in ancient Roman building, not for necessity, meaning to hold up the structure, but purely for decoration. In the Middle Ages, the theater of Marcellus was co-opted as a place for wealthy people to live, and it remains a private condo. Julius Caesar had been born to a poor but patrician family, but as his fame grew, so did his wealth. Caesar mostly lived in the city center near the Roman Forum with Calpurnia, his third wife. But he also had residences in Trastevere and the Pincio, or the Pincian Hill. Caesar's home in Trastevere was called the Orti Cesaris. It is here that he is thought to have entertained the Egyptian queen Cleopatra when she visited Rome in 46 BCE. Historians don't know where exactly in Trastevere Caesar's home once stood, but if you visit this neighborhood in Rome, you can imagine that Julius Caesar once walked here. Caesar also had lush gardens on the Pincian Hill on the complete opposite side of the city from Trastevere. The Pincio is not considered one of the original seven hills of Rome, but it was, of course, part of ancient Rome. After Caesar's death, his close friend Sallust acquired his gardens. The gardens of Sallust were famous for their luxurious and opulently designed landscapes, lush vegetation, fountains, and terraces. Parts of the gardens of Sallust are still visible today, and you can see them from street level. My favorite time to see them is in April when they are covered in wisteria blossoms. The Via Appia Antica, or Appian Way, was built in 312 BCE and eventually extended all the way to the port of Brindisi on the Adriatic Sea. It became Rome's most important road, opening Rome up to the east. By the time Julius Caesar came to power, the road had deteriorated and was in terrible shape. Caesar understood the strategic importance of the road to Rome. He became curator of the Appian Way in 66 BCE and spent large amounts of state funds to restore it. I love walking along the Appia Antica, and I highly recommend it as a wonderful thing to do in Rome if you want to see the catacombs, explore some green space, or just get away from the crowds and experience another side of Rome. And while you won't find any traces of Julius Caesar on the Appian Way, just remember that without him, the road might have faded into disuse and might not even be here today. So we briefly touched on the Pantheon at the beginning of this video. Many people don't realize it, but on one side of the Pantheon, you can clearly see remnants of a building that was built under the reign of Julius Caesar. Located in the Campus Martius of Rome, Campo Marzio, or Field of Mars, right next to what would eventually become the Pantheon, the Septa Iulia was where citizens gathered to cast votes. We can see the Septa Iulia on the Forma Urbis Romae, a map of the city of Rome as it existed in the early 3rd century CE. The Septa Iulia was in the form of a quadruporticus, an architectural feature made popular by Caesar. After Caesar's assassination in 44 BCE, work continued on projects that Caesar had set into motion, including the Septa Iulia. The building was finally completed and dedicated by Augustus's right-hand man and best friend, Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, in 26 BCE. This was right around the time that Agrippa also dedicated the first version of the building we would come to call the Pantheon. The Septa Iulia and Agrippa's Pantheon were two of many buildings destroyed in the Great Fire of Rome in the year 80 CE. Both of these buildings were among many buildings that were rebuilt and restored under the reign of Emperor Domitian. We have evidence in the form of brickwork and literary sources that tell us that just like the neighboring Pantheon, the Septa Iulia was restored once again under Emperor Hadrian in the second century. Along the western side of the Septa Iulia, was the Porticus Argonautarum. It was completed by Agrippa in around 25 BCE, and it received its name from the artwork it depicted, which showed Jason and the Argonauts. And while this building is mostly gone, I find it pretty amazing that we can see traces of a building that Julius Caesar conceived right here in the center of Rome. Unlike the Roman Forum, which was considered the center of the city, a government forum was a place where laws were made and where the current ruler solidified his legacy. Julius Caesar envisioned his forum in 54 BCE. On the Via dei Fori Imperiali, or the Street of the Imperial Forums, you can see three imperial forums, or fora, along one side, and the forum of Julius Caesar on the other side. 
And when you visit the Roman Forum, you can even walk through Caesar's Forum. Many people don't even realize this because they stick to the more popular sites of the Roman Forum, but if you venture towards the Curia Iulia and beyond it, it will literally take you on walkways right through Julius Caesar's Forum. Whether you see it from above or from inside the Forum itself, you can still see remains of some of the structures that once stood here. Among these remnants is a partially reconstructed section of the temple to Venus Genetrix. Julius Caesar revered Venus Genetrix because he believed he had descended from the goddess Venus. This temple was a way for Caesar to link his lineage to divine origins, which reinforced his authority and legitimacy. Julius Caesar was an integral member of Roman political life, and he would have spent a great deal of time in and around the Roman Forum. After he rose to power, Julius Caesar began to change the landscape of the Forum itself by having several new buildings and monuments constructed. One of these buildings was the Basilica Iulia, which was used for administrative and judicial functions. As with the Theater of Marcellus, although Julius Caesar oversaw the beginning of the building project of the Basilica Iulia in 46 BCE, he did not live to see it finished. The structure was completed by Augustus after Caesar's death. Unfortunately, most of this basilica was either destroyed or simply deteriorated over the centuries, and not much of it is left. Today, only the bases of these towering columns remain. But if you go to one end of the Roman Forum, you can pretty easily make out the original design of this basilica. You can also see this from the terrace of Campidoglio and from the tabularium of the Capitoline Museums. The Roman Curia, known as the Curia Iulia, was also in the Roman Forum. The Curia was basically the Senate House where political decisions were made. I am blown away by how much of the Curia Iulia remains intact. This is because, like the Pantheon, the Curia Iulia was saved from being plundered because it was turned into a Christian church in the 7th century. The floor dates to a 3rd century reconstruction under Emperor Diocletian. And so while Julius Caesar may not have walked on this floor, he did walk and work in this building, and you can almost feel his presence there. Plus, I think the floor is really stunning. The Curia Iulia is one of the super sites in the Roman Forum. You can easily visit it by buying the Roman Forum Super Pass or one of the full experience tickets for the Colosseum. It's also accessible if you have the annual Colosseum Pass. The Curia Iulia is not open daily, so check Co-op Culture for its opening days. I'm just blown away that you can visit this building. I can just feel the walls reverberating when those senators were arguing and making laws. Julius Caesar met his tragic end on March 15th, 44 BCE, also known as the Ides of March, on the steps of Pompey's Theater. Every year on this date, the Gruppo Storico Romano reenacts Caesar's stabbing, keeping the memory of this historic moment alive. Amazingly, we know the exact spot of his assassination on the steps of Pompey's Theater. The site has been marked by an umbrella pine that was placed inside the ruins we know today as Largo di Torre Argentina. They've recently opened the site to visitors, and I did a video about it so you can watch that if you want to know more. But even if you don't go inside of these ruins, you can easily see the spot of Julius Caesar's assassination from street level. I know many people think that Julius Caesar was killed in the Roman Forum, but that's just because that's how William Shakespeare described it in his play. Actually, at the time of Caesar's murder, the Curia Iulia had been badly damaged by fire, so they were temporarily using Pompey's Theater as a Senate house. I find it ironic that Caesar had tried to outdo his rival Pompey by building a theater larger than his only to be assassinated on that very site. Following Caesar's assassination, Augustus commissioned a temple in his honor within the Roman Forum. The temple of Divus Iulia served as a place to venerate Caesar's memory, and it was a further indication of Augustus's desire to solidify Julius Caesar's legacy. Today, there is not much left of this temple, in fact, I find most people walk around it without really paying much attention to it because it is in such a deteriorated state. However, after Caesar's death, he was cremated and his ashes were probably stored in a shrine in this temple. You can visit this shrine and you'll usually find fresh flowers and sometimes coins and even notes on folded paper, especially around the Ides of March. 
So where can you see images of Julius Caesar in Rome? I've got a few obvious places where you can see images of Julius Caesar, but also a few secret spots, so stick around. Probably the most famous and obvious image of Julius Caesar in Rome is the bronze statue in front of his forum along the Via dei Fori Imperiali. This is a replica of the original marble statue that's inside of Campidoglio. The one in Campidoglio is inside of the modern Senate and is inaccessible to the public. There are three busts of Julius Caesar made right around the time he was alive or right after he died. So we can consider that these busts are a pretty close likeness to Julius Caesar. One of these is the Chiaramonti Caesar, named for a wing of the Vatican Museums where it originally stood. Unfortunately, it's been moved to the Gregory Profane wing of the Vatican Museums, and they've put it in a room that is roped off, and so you really can't see it very easily. Another is a little-known bust of Caesar, which is in the very undervisited museum of Centrale Montimartini. And the third bust is called the Tusculum Portrait, and it is in Turin, or Torino. Most people walk through the tapestries gallery in the Vatican Museums and admire the stories of Jesus Christ, in particular his resurrection. It's an amazing tapestry because Jesus' eyes and arm and even the slab of his tomb seem to follow you as you walk past it. But I think most people miss the tapestry at the very end of these stories, maybe because it clearly doesn't have anything to do with Jesus' life. It's a huge tapestry depicting the assassination of Julius Caesar. I must admit, I kind of find it weird that it's placed here after this whole series of tapestries all about Jesus Christ, but it is a masterpiece of craftsmanship and so beautifully made. I try to take in some details every time I see it. Finally, I tried to find Julius Caesar in the Capitoline Museums, which are the oldest museums in the world. I figured he'd be in there somewhere. I found very little of Julius Caesar in these museums, but here is what I did find. In one of the rooms, there's a film playing. It's called L'Eredità di Cesare e la Conquista del Tempo, which means Caesar's Legacy and the Conquest of Time. The film lasts about five minutes and shows alternatively in English and Italian. It's projected onto the wall, so it's pretty easy to see. It was meant to be temporary, but it's been up for over a year after it was supposed to leave, so I think it's going to stay there. There's a sort of small, tucked away room in the Capitoline Museums called the Medieval Room, and in here you can spot this ball that used to sit on top of the Vatican obelisk. In the Middle Ages, they thought that Julius Caesar's ashes were inside of this ball. In the 16th century, under Pope Sixtus V, architect Domenico Fontana studied the ball and determined that it was solid and that nothing could be held inside. The Capitoline Museums boasts an excellent coin collection. Did you know that coins from ancient Rome have helped us to know so much of what we know today? One of the best collections of ancient coins is in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England. But here in the Capitoline Museums, you can see some really cool coins in their collection. And among them, you'll find one or two from the time of Caesar's rule. So what do you think? Did you know about all these places associated with Julius Caesar from ancient Rome? To find out more about the site of Julius Caesar's assassination, the history associated with it, and how to visit, check out my video right here.